Thank you so much. I, I, I have to say that when you say everybody runs away from physiology, wow, I mean, really, we shouldn't because it is amazing, no. absolutely just gobsmackingly wonderful and um, we're learning all the time more and more about how our bodies work and um, and as midwives um, that's something that we should really be interested in because we witness that unfolding that physiological process unfolding on a daily basis um, even working antenatally with pregnancy and in the birth room as well um, it is quite wonderful I'm going to just share the screen and um, bring up my um, presentation. Now, I know that, um, and I do hope that um, people attending the, the, this, this presentation will have seen the earlier presentation that I did, which actually we, we talked about that physiology in more depth. And, and um, I'm obviously carrying that conversation on, but I do want to just dip back again to, uh, re to remind us a little bit about what we're talking about. And do we know enough? That is really the question. We are not really trained that well in anatomy and physiology as far as birth concerned. Um, and it actually, that gap in our knowledge really hinders us. But if we look at these pictures here, we've got a picture of the pelvis, the bony pelvis. Wonderful. That's fantastic. Sacrum, two big um, hip bones, the ilium or iliac, iliac bone and symphysis pubis at the front, which is joined together with uh, cartilage and the coccyx as well at the end of the sacrum. So we know that exists and that's wonderful. Um, and then we've got some dimensions as well, anatomic conjugate, obstetric conjugate, and we know those as well. And maybe, maybe that's some of, maybe I remember wanting to run away from that because it seemed so complex and I couldn't really translate that into the bathroom for it to make sense to what was going on uh, for, for, for these women and birthing people especially when they struggled. So um, while that is valuable information, it is only a tiny part of what we need to know about. And then there's the, the pelvic floor itself. And of course, we do all know about the pelvic floor. That is something that's taught. And, and we understand that that's a very important area of um, our bodies, especially when we're having a baby. But we need to know more about that. And I just want to just this is what we, should, we, we talked about in the first part one. Um, so let's just look at it again and actually really take this in. Look at those photographs, um, those pictures. I just want to say, wow, every time I look at it and I look at it quite often, it's amazing. Um, you can see the, the, the whole body actually is connected. Everything's connected to each other, basically from the tip of our toes to the top of our head. Um, uh, it's all connected and we have fascia and um, we have muscles and ligaments running down through the pelvis onto the leg, uh, the lower limbs um, and upwards from the knees and the ankles upwards through again, through the hooking onto the bony pelvis um, across from the sacrum, um, across the pelvis through onto the top of the femur. Uh, that's the piriformis. We've got obturator internus that's attached to the pelvic floor, and we don't even talk about that. This is stuff we need to know about. And that's what I'm kind of feel like I'm on a bit of a mission, really. I mean, I started off with this really wanting to um, talk about helping people who were suffering from a labor dystocia. And indeed, that is the essence of what this is about. But if we don't know this stuff, this part of anatomy and physiology, then we really are um, hindered because it, that, that, the, not knowing this translates into the bathroom as um, a pretty huge gap in our knowledge, which means that we then practice, um, uh, we have practices that hinder birth and we don't even realize it for some of it. Let's have a look at this a little bit further. Here we have, I really want it to be very easily understood because it isn't that complex. And I think bringing it down to three main disruptions, a labor dystocia, 
three main disruptions of uh, the physiological process that cause a labor dystocia are fear, medicalization, and biomechanical issues. And I think we all recognize that really. Fear, of course, is going to affect the neurohormonal um, exquisite orchestra of hormones. And um, medicalization, as you can see in the picture, has a whole gamut of, of interference in the process. Uh, many of those interventions, of course, are unnecessary. And we know this. We have studies and research that tell us that. And we, we, we know that because we witness it. And uh, this is a birthing person on the bed, um, uh, hooked up to all sorts of um, drugs, artificial oxytocin, most likely, uh, and, uh, and, and electronic monitoring and so on. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, uh, and then the th this is the third one, which is what I'm really interested in, both the fear and the, I'm, an interest, I'm interested in all of it. But uh, what can I do about it? I'm a hypnobirthing uh, practitioner, so I can address the fear aspect. And I work uh, with biomechanics and learn about it and teach it and teach it to the women. And that's my contribution to trying to... Um, to make birth a little bit easier. The medicalization needs all of us to start shouting out about that. Um, and so this is how we, we can change that conversation is by addressing these issues. So, as I said, I was going to talk a wee bit about the, bi uh, the biomedical solutions, which we just see again, another picture there of a woman lying on her back, attached to all sorts of technology and we do things to her so when she has a labor dystocia. These are often, this list that you can see is often what we are providing as a solution to that problem, but it doesn't address the root cause. Now the root cause, and I'm talking specifically biomechanics, of course, because that's my thing. Biomechanics, uh, meaning that the babies, how does that baby pass through the pelvis? Um, uh, uh, and it's um, most likely the cause is a imbalance in the pelvis, reducing the space available for the baby to pass through. And much of that can be resolved in other ways, which we're going to look at in a moment. Um, but most of what, how it's addressed in the institution, in the hospital, is this, this list rupturing the membranes. We know that is one of the first courses of action that takes place. Let's break the waters and we'll see if we can get you moving forward with that. And that alone actually doesn't have a lot of evidence to support it. But it often goes along with artificial oxytocin augmentation. And uh, even those two together are based on very low level evidence. I want to just say, I'm going to, I've written it down because um, I want to be really correct in how I'm quoting this from a um, piece of research, Zhang, Z-H-A-N-G. I haven't put it in the end of the, I'm sorry, I haven't included that um, at the end of the presentation, but if you look up Zhang, Z-H-A-N-G, and he did, all, and, and his researchers did a lot of work on that labor progression and particograms and so on, and actually put forward an alternative. He, as is quoted from their research, and it says, synthetic oxytocin has been classified as a potentially harmful medication and is in the list of high alert medication by the Institute for Safe Medication Practices in the USA. And despite this, the rate of oxytocin administration in Western countries has been reported to be between 44% to 75% in the last decade. That is quite astonishing that we are using a drug that is a potentially harmful drug. And in fact, we have seen it ourselves. It has lots of contraindications. One of the contraindications is borderline CPD, cephalopelvic dis disproportion. And cephalopelvic disproportion is one of the re reasons given for caesarean section <laughs> that's um, been, um, it's a labor dystocia, and the reason they've given it is CPD. 
and um, that goes down in the documentation. Now, CPD is actually really quite rare, absolute CPD. And that's because, um, you know, it's that's mostly to do with uh, def deformations of the um, uh, bony pelvis, like rickets and so on, uh, or maybe even soft tissue tumours, or that's rare. Um, it's a relative CPD um, is how the baby's passing through, and it probably is a bigger baby. Really, um, that remains to be seen if we're growing our babies too big for us to pass through our pelvises. I do have lots of doubt on that, and I think the evidence is very um, shaky on that as well. But much more likely, and in fact, this is what the, the, what the studies are telling us, it's um, suboptimal position of the baby. So the baby's head is cocked to the side or deflexed, or the baby's OP. And, and those are the relative CPD issues. And here we are using oxytocin that is contraindicated for that purpose. Um, are we causing more harm than, than good? Directed and Valsalva pushing. I'm sure that there's a lot of people who are listening to this who have witnessed that on a daily basis. It still happens in the birth room. Big breath in, chin on your chest, push, push until you're blue in the face until your little hemorrhages come in your eyeballs. This is not a good practice and it has evidence uh, to say that's, that's not good practice and it's not helpful. Electronic fetal monitoring is another one. It's uh, an automatic if you have a labor dystocia. And um, um, I would ask you to have a look at Kirsten Small's blogs. She's an obstetrician in, in Australia who is really talking a lot about this and um, debunking a lot of um, the, the myths surrounding the benefits of EFM, uh, there are very few. We need to be looking at that. Look at what do, we're doing to these women who are suffering a long labour dystocia, a long, difficult journey to have their baby. Um, they're having vaginal examinations, not just a few, not one or two. They're having maybe even up into double figures. Because, you know, this is a long latent phase. This is then a very long journey through their first stage, perhaps, and their second stage. And vagina examinations are not very reliable and especially not reliable when you have a suboptimal position because those landmarks are not there and we're not quite sure what we're feeling. And we also seem to rely very much as, uh, on it as a predictor of how she's progressing. It's not a predictor, and, and, and we know it's not a predictor um, uh, because we see women coming in and it's three centimetres uh, and then 45 minutes later they have a baby. You know, so we, we, we know that can change at any time. I'm not saying it's not useful because it has a place, of course, but we overuse them and vagina examinations are a really intrusive um, intervention. Uh, and and one in four women have had um, sexual abuse in their lives, and that's the ones that we know about. So um, lying naked, half naked, on a bed with your legs open with a stranger's fingers inside your vagina is quite something. And uh, these women suffer terribly uh, from, those, uh, from, from those practices. Time limits, we, we don't, uh, do we give enough time? Sometimes it's just an unfolding that just needs a little bit more. Um, uh, yeah, it just needs time to work itself out. And if she's not suffering too much, then that's good. She may find her own way to resolving the problem herself, as so many women will do if they are given the right environment. Um, and of course, that's where continuity of care comes in, trusting your um, the birth professional who's attending to you um, and supporting you. And, um, you know, being instinctive in your birth movements can help resolve a labor dystocia itself. But it's not, it doesn't always work like that, but it does um, have an impact. Restricting eating and drinking, of course, um, that's nourishment. And it's, uh, we know that that is, is not uh, evidence-based as well. And re right now we're restricting birth companions. And as I said, having somebody you trust and know at the birth makes a huge difference to the outcomes. And in a labour dystocia in particular, that's a long haul and it's a really long, difficult time not to have your birth companion with you, during, especially during these pandemic times. The language we're using is very detrimental. Failure to progress. You have failed. No, we haven't. Women haven't, birthing people have not failed. 
we have failed to understand. So we need to fill that gap in our knowledge and find out more so we can help them. Uh, in the environment, um, people who give birth in at home and in birth units, centres, midwife-led units, we know the outcome is, is, is improved for them. And they have, again, because that environment um, it, it is often, um, of course, a comfortable, safe place for the, the woman to give birth, but also for the birth practitioner who's in that environment is much more likely to have the philosophy that supports the physiological process because she believes in it and trusts in it. And of course, there's much more to it than that, but we're kind of, we've got, uh, time is passing. We've got a short time to go through this. So what can we do? Um, freedom of movement, of course, is top. Freedom of movement, and that is quite challenging in an obstetric unit where you've got lots of machinery, but we can do that and we have to really, really look at that. However, what can we do if we've got a bed and we're on that bed with an epidural or attached to things, we have got a peanut ball and we know that a peanut ball increases pelvic dimensions and it changes the shape of the pelvis depending on how you use it. And as you can see in this picture, there's different ways um, and that's only a few. I mean, you can be quite creative as I'll show you in a moment. And this reduces, that we have evidence to support it. It reduces the cesarean section rate and it reduces the length in labor. Why don't we use it? If you're not using it, please do use it. Um, and if you haven't got it in your unit, please get them very, I mean, really not an expensive uh, tool to have. And here is a, a, a way of using it. Uh, uh, and uh, again, it's the, these are some biomechanical tool, but this is a, a way of using it, which is really beneficial, especially in the second stage, when the pushing stage, where you want to open up the outlet. And instead of saying, open up your legs wide, and I think we talked about that on the last one, so do have a look at that. Um, you have internal rotation of the femur, meaning you're putting your pointing your toes to each other with your, your heels outwards, that opens up the outlet. And you can facilitate that with using a ball. And you can see that uh, in the picture, there's a peanut ball there. And the midwife is illustrating that position. Her knee is lower uh, than her, her foot and um, her femur is rotating internally. And that's making more space for the baby. How are we doing for time? So we've got um, questions and answers, haven't we? I mean, a, a Q and A session after this, have we? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Just... So you've okay. got till twelve. Twelve. I've got not good. Okay. Um, just going to go back here, just to say to 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 mention this um, a little bit further. I thought there was. I thought I had less time than I did. Using hip opening, muscle releasing fascial stretching techniques and positions will make a little bit more space for the baby. Remember, that's what we're talking about, a little bit more space. That's all the baby needs. This is what's stopping the baby calming down. This, this is the biomechanical issue. Now, it can be caused because, um, and it's got a variety of uh, possibilities because that biomechanical issue could be higher up in the pelvis or it could be lower or it could be all through the pelvis so the you might find that the baby is having a difficulty getting into the pelvis at the top properly and you can do certain positions or we can you can learn the positions to um, encourage the or suggest to the the woman and birthing person to 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 do that will help the baby engage better and you can also use um, as i say this in the picture this is for the outlet for the baby coming through um past the spines in the midsection and, and out. Um, there are things like rebozo, very simple things. Rebozo, um, I'm going to show you one of the techniques in the next slide, but this is a Mexican scarf and the midwives there use it as a tool. Of course, they've had decades, um, I mean, hundreds of, of, of years uh, using the, the, their rebozo um, and they, they know it very well. Um, we, 
if we don't use a rebozo, we're using a justice scarf. It has to, you know, you can't call it a rebozo unless it's coming from that country. But a scarf um, will suffice. And it is a really easy thing to do. And it's a very good thing to have um, to teach the partners because then they can become a real support and help uh, relax the, the woman and also help the baby have a little bit more space. Sideline release is one of the, the positions I think is just amazing. It works really well. I'm just going to show you that in a second. But identifying early before the women become compromised, that is really important. And it's something that, we, again, we really need to work on. We are not very good at understanding or identifying a biomechanical issue uh, uh, in the, in the labour room, in the birth room. We um, have, it does appear that we have struggle now to be able to identify or differentiate between the normal birth signs and the abnormal. Excruciating, agonizing pain is abnormal. There's something not quite right. And yet we have um, normalized that. And I know that those amongst you will have witnessed midwives who have, have said, um, you know, they've, they've seen a woman come in and she looks like she's going to have a baby. She's really going for it. I mean, she's climbing the wall. She's going to have her baby. She's ready. And she's two centimetres. And they might say, hmm, if that's her now, what's she going to be like in, real, in active labour or true labour? And they haven't recognised that that's not, this is not correct. It is not correct to have agonising pain when you're two centimetres and we need to to be thinking, well, what's causing this? Is it fear or is it a biomechanical issue? And then, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, you haven't. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, um, the so identifying early is really important. There's shaking the apple tree. There's that rebozo. Um, that is a rebozo that they're using around the buttocks, uh, giving a good old shake, those big gluteal muscles and fascia, a piriformis, ligaments, everything's kind of good old jiggle, releasing tension. And you can put it around the thighs as well and jiggle that and really um, make a difference to um, how that woman's feeling. Now you can use that all the way through the, the labor just because it's a lovely thing to do. But if you actually run into problems, um, when, when she, if the woman's running into problems when she's pushing her baby out, then this is a really good way to release that tension and the baby often comes after you've been doing this for, for 10, 15 minutes. Um, sideline releases in the other picture. This is really, really beneficial uh, at any time in the labor uh, if there's a labor dystocia. And um, it releases tension, uh, sorry, it stretches uh, ligaments and fascia and muscle in the hip, in the pelvis, on, uh, and you do both sides. Um, this one that you're seeing is a modified version um, of the sideline release. The sideline release would normally, the leg would hang freely, but in this position, uh, it is modified for an epidural because we're not absolutely certain um, if a, a, a full sideline release is. Um, if there's an issue with an epidural, we're not sure if that has, um, we don't want to cause harm. So we, we do a modified version, which works very well. This is a midwife in Chelsea and Westminster who, 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 who uses this position very successfully, right up to somebody waiting to go to theatre because the baby's not coming out. So it's always good. We have these, we have these things that we can use. Um, and I hope we will start to use um, more gentle physiological solutions and come away from those harsh and harmful, uh, many, many times harmful uh, biomedical solutions. Uh, just um, that's my um, website and uh, links to the course. And of course, I teach professionals. I, keep, I teach midwives and, and, and birth professionals uh, this because we all need to know about it. Okay. Um, I think I've also got a few. Uh, that, that was from the last one, but it's still um, relevant, uh, these um, references. Okay, thank you very much. That's fabulous, Molly. Thank you so much. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm loving the peanut ball. Yes, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Ten pounds. <laughs> ten pounds. Ten I've, pounds. I've, I've, I know. Ten pounds from Argus and other stores, of course. Oh. <laughs>
<laughs> but I mean, the, it's not expensive, is it? And, uh, you know, it can make a huge difference. Yeah, and I, I think the, the apple tree, the shaking apple tree mm. um, position, because that looks something that would be, I think, I can imagine women would laugh if you were doing that. Absolutely, Sue. It brings laughter into the room. It lightens everything up and it just changes the atmosphere and it's very enjoyable as well, <laughs> as you're quite right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's grand. Well, we haven't had any questions through. If, oh, you, okay. have any, if you have any questions... Send them in because we have we have three more minutes of Molly <laughs> if you choose to do so. I mean, it, I think I think it was interesting that some of the images of they, they really highlighted the sort of environmental ones of being mm -hmm. very, you know, this woman in the midst of all the yeah. equipment. You can imagine being very afraid and that really interfering with the natural Absolutely. oxytocins. Absolutely. And there's a, a real lap uh, overlap between fear and biomechanics. And when you have a biomechanical issue, and I've had one, my first baby was back to back. And um, so I do know from firsthand experience, but also witnessing and observing uh, women and birthing people having their babies and having a biomechanical issue, there is a fear overlap because they know it's not working and they will say there's something not right. They've got this baby inside them. This baby's passing through their pelvis. They know. And they go, no, this isn't right. Something's up. And they're fearful because it, and it's sore. It's really painful. And, um, and really painful early on. It doesn't correlate uh, with the progress in labor. And so there, there's a lot of fear. So you have to work out, that's our skill as midwives, to work out what is going on. We, we, and and I, I love that. And that's, that's how I learned. I learned it from the women. A lot of my observations came from watching, watchful waiting, watchful yeah. attendance. So, and I think, I, I think what you've pointed out is understanding the physiology, because if you don't, for example, understand when you've done a vaginal examination, mm. that the baby is OP, mm. because I know, you know, sometimes you see notes and it says unable to defined position and you kind of think well mm. you should be able to have some idea somewhere mm, mm. if you know that you can plan ahead with the woman yeah I, and I actually think that um if if position undefined that's already an indicator that it's a suboptimal position mm. however of course it's very complex and we've only got a very short time to talk about this uh, sometimes there's the two things I just want to finish saying with that is that um it, it, it's not always a negative if it's a, what I'm saying is a suboptimal position meaning that it might not feel OA flexed or A mm. um, it might be a little bit perhaps asynclitic because if it's higher up it's actually the baby's trying to avoid the is avoiding the sacral promontory so it will naturally go into an asynclitic position to bypass that part of the pelvis and then once it hits the um, pelvic floor then it can sort its head out and rotate and so that might be a natural progression through the pelvis that they may take that position up and it might not be causing a labor to so we've got to match it with what else is going on is she mm. struggling it might even be the way she gives birth She's individual. She might give birth like that. You know, we see these women who come in and they, they get on with the labour and it's fine. And then the baby comes out and it's face to poops. And we go, oh, who knew? <laughs> uh, I guess it was normal for them. So that's not a labour dystocia. But if you felt that, you think, oh, that's not quite right. So we go, <laughs> it's quite, um, I, th I love it because this is what midwifery is about. Isn't and I think I think I'm going to close at that point because that is just a fantastic way to close your session. Okay. I think thank you so much, Molly. I think thank your you passion so for this physiology. I think we all need a bit of that <laughs> in our day to day life to understand and help women and their babies through the process. I think the individualization bit of it is so important. Absolutely. And that's absolutely fantastic. We're going to have to book you again, Molly, because it's just, oh, the story is you know, not ended. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you so much, Sue. Thank you very much.